Christians can't have fun. Amen? You know, as I was enjoying that praise and worship song so much from our choir and our musicians, it's just so wonderful. And I had a flashback image. Now, I hope you don't judge me for this, but I had a flashback image. For those of you who remember, do you remember when Soul Train used to come on and you had that train that was just kind of bouncing back and forth like this? That's what South Bay is doing right now. We are praising the Lord, and we are worshiping. It's a celebration. Happy anniversary, family. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Tammy Long. I'm the lead pastor here, and we have come to celebrate the goodness of God for 36 years. Amen? Amen. So we're going to keep our worship celebration going, and at this time, let us enter into a time of worship together. Amen? And amen. Look across the room and just tell somebody, say, God has been so good. Oh, come on, say it like you mean it. Say, God has been so good. Hallelujah. Come on, Ben, I got a reason to praise him. If you got a reason to praise the Lord today, can you just put your hands together right here and offer him a clap, offering of praise as we give him our worship. Hallelujah. Say, I got a reason. To clap my hands, to clap my hands. Say, I got, I got a reason to sing and dance. Sing and dance. Say, I got, I got a reason to lift my voice. To lift my voice. Say, I got, I got a reason to rejoice. To rejoice. For life, strength, and health. For life, strength, and health. For joy, peace, and wealth. For joy, peace, and wealth. For your divine favor. For your divine favor. For being a merciful savior. For being a merciful savior. Cause even when I was faithless. Even when I was faithless. Your love it never changed. Your love Hallelujah. Never changed. So ever faithful, loving God. So ever faithful, loving God. We give you all the praise. We give you all the praise. Say I got a reason. I to clap my hands, to clap my hands. Say I got, a I got a reason, to sing and dance. To sing and dance. Say I got, a reason, I got a reason, to lift my voice. To lift my voice. Say I got, a reason, I got a reason, to rejoice. To rejoice. Say it again. Strength and health, For thank you, God. And joy, peace, and wealth. For joy, peace, and wealth. For your divine favor. For, your divine favor. For being a merciful Savior. Being Hallelujah. Merciful Savior. Cause even when I was faithless, even when I was faithless, your love it never changed. So ever faithful, loving God, we come to give you all the praise. Thou who, thou who. Oh, God. 
We stand here this morning because of Jesus, because his faithfulness, because he died on the cross that we might live. Anybody grateful for Jesus this morning? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's just take a moment and just silent our hearts and just come before the king with worship this morning, just to honor him, to be with him, singing to an audience of one this morning. Let's worship him. Hallelujah.
in the midst of thee, in the midst of thee, forever and ever. Amen. So we purposely chose this song in honor of our anniversary as this is a real South Bay classic song. Um, and what I'd like us to do this next time is sing it almost in the way that we used to. So the men will kick us off and then us ladies will respond. And I only know this happened because I'm so used to Dr. Long and he would rear up the men and get them ready to go. And they would sing with conviction and power. And so we're gonna ask that our brothers lead us in this song and ladies, let's follow them um, as we go through this song. So brothers, are you ready? So the Lord thy God, brothers. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, that song brought up history. That you were in the midst of these forever and ever and ever and ever. Lord, we love you, we adore you, we worship you, we praise you. We give all honor and glory to you, Lord. Lord, because you first love us and you teach us and taught us how to love. You teach us and taught us, Lord, how to put others before ourselves. That other people matter, Lord Jesus. And you taught South Bay and their leadership to teach the same. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, there are not enough words to thank you. We could be here for for hours and hours. But Lord, we also want to ask you for forgiveness of our sins, Lord Jesus. Those known and unknown. Those intentional and unintentional. Lord, we desire to be, be cleansed before we come before your throne of grace. Lord, we thank you. Lord, there's so much going on in the world. There's so much going on in our families. 
And Lord, we want to lift up those things to you today. Lord, our world, Lord Jesus, our country need your divine intervention, Lord Jesus. We pray for the leadership, Lord, that they are able to look to you and to follow your precepts and concepts, Lord, in terms of running our world. That we accept other people's differences and embrace them and learn from them. Lord, we thank you for that. But I also want to lift up and pray for those who have kidnapped in Haiti, Lord Jesus. Lord, we can't even imagine that in this country. But Lord, we ask that you protect them and keep them and that be, they be released, Lord Jesus. But I also pray, Lord, that those who captured them, Lord Jesus, that you pierce their heart, Lord Jesus. That they begin to see them as human beings and people that you created. That they too matter. Lord, and we thank you for that. Lord, and then we want to bring it home, Lord Jesus. We've had a lot of things going on in our, our church, Lord Jesus. And people who are suffering and they're desiring healing and, they're, and mental health healing, Lord Jesus. And financial support and relationships, Lord Jesus, that need work. Lord, you know who's struggling, you know who's having complications and who's having challenges. Lord, you know those things. And I ask that you touch any and all of those who are going through any particular thing at this time. Lord, I pray that they look to you for their help cometh from you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I lift them up to you, Lord Jesus. And that you instill in them the desire to serve you and to seek you, Lord Jesus. And we're not minimizing how painful it is, Lord. We know it's painful. We know it's difficult. But Lord, the only one that can see us through it is you. Is you, Lord. And Lord, I want to pray for what's going to happen here today at South Bay. We are so excited. 36 years, you brought us a mighty long way. And Lord, we are so grateful. So Lord, we want to lift up the leadership in this church, the preached word, that you anoint anyone and everyone that's involved in this service today, because Lord, this service is for you. Though we are, have a responsibility to reach out to others, but this service is for you, God. We are grateful for the things you have done. We are grateful for the things you are doing. And we're excitedly grateful for the things you will do. But we can't give you enough honor and enough praise. You are our first and last. You are our Prince of Peace. And Lord, we just love you. And these things we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, South Bay. Happy anniversary. Yay! And so um, I just want to introduce our young people who are going to be bringing a very special selection to you this morning. Um, they will be ministering in American Sign Language. Um, to all of you, and I just want you to know they've been working really hard. They practiced on Zoom. They look really good, and there's going to be parts where we're going to need y'all to be a part of this too, so come on, let's give and take, um, but I just want to welcome them on stage now, so give them a round of applause as they come.
Let's do it one more time. Come on, open your mouth and say, I need you. I need you. Let me hear you. You need me. You need me. For we're all. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Stand with me. Agree with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is His will. It is His will that every need be supplied. You're important to you. You are important to me. Yes, you are. I need, I need you to survive. fun this morning. I, I said we had fun this morning. I am, I'm looking forward to when we can move it up a notch. I've been watching the brothers and sisters in Africa as they worship, and I noticed that when they worship, they, they put everything into it. They dance, they do all kind of stuff. So I've been practicing. They go like this. So I, I, I almost broke out in it this morning, almost. <laughs> Next time, I won't promise you I won't, but I'm getting close Amen. to us just dancing before the Lord. Amen. 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 So it was so great to see all of you, and I, I just love to see us sing with joy and smiles on our faces and happy in the Lord and celebrating who he is and what he's done for us. And uh, not having these long faces like the world has come to an end. It hasn't yet and probably won't tomorrow either. But uh, it's just, it was just joyful. And I, I so enjoy the band. You guys are just wonderful. So appreciate you. 
I, I, I always get a little nervous when my brother that's playing the keyboard gets carried away. He starts leaning over. He goes from one side to the other. I keep thinking one of these mornings he's going to slide right on off of that thing. But it brings such joy to see people enjoying what they're doing for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. So I, I've entitled my message today, We're 36, Now What? Is this yet another defining moment? I want you to bow with me in prayer as we invite God to guide us. Our Father, it is in your presence that we find the fullness of joy. And it's around your word that we find enlightenment. And it is our heart's desire that today you might use this moment to speak to us. All of us here long to hear a word from you. And we just pray that this day you would seize this moment and use it to speak to each of our hearts. We ask your blessing upon it, and we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. And everybody said amen. amen. In 1985, Ronald Reagan was president. The 49ers won their second Super Bowl. The Titanic was located. Whitney was singing, Saving All My Love for You. And Stevie Wonder was responding with Part-Time Lover. That was 1985 when we started this church. It was less than 10 of us that met in a house and decided that God wanted us to start a church. And it was, it was fun. And it was hard. And for us who was involved in those early days, it was a defining moment. When I speak of defining moment, I am speaking of those times when we are faced with a hardship or a heartache or a crisis or a, a challenge that, that shapes our direction and focus from that moment on, a moment when we clearly see what is most important, a moment when we experience the true limitations and weaknesses each of us has as human beings, a moment when we realize that we cannot do it all, be it all, know it all, control it all. A moment when we get a realistic perspective on our world and are forced to adjust our expectations accordingly. It's now 36 years later, and the world as we knew it has vastly changed and almost seems like it's unraveling before our eyes. It's a world much like the biblical story around the man whose name was Gideon. After Joshua had defeated all of Israel's enemies and established the tribes of Israel in the promised land, he died. And instead of appointing another main military leader, God would occasionally raise up men and women that were called judges to lead segments of the Israelites against local enemies. The very fact that they had to fight these enemies was due to their disobedience at times. Nevertheless, God was gracious and would provide them with the necessary leadership to get them back on track. The period of the judges was known as one of the lowest times in Israel's history. In fact, the last verse in the book of Judges says that in those days, every man did what was right in his own eyes. 
It's in this setting that Gideon's story takes place. He's one of those local judges raised up by God to deliver a localized group. His job was to deal with the Midianites. The Midianites would be what we might call today terrorists. They would wait until the people of Israel had finished planting their crops, and then they would sweep down upon them, stealing their crops, stealing their herds, and whatever they couldn't take with them, they destroyed, so the Israelites would have nothing left. This went on for seven long years. And it was starting to get a bit old, so the people cried out to God to deliver them, and God in his usual style, called Gideon to lead his people out of their oppression. You find this story in Judges 6 and 7, and it's in 7 that I want to draw from for our, our message today. Gideon is hiding, and God finds him where he's hiding. And he says to him, O oh, great man of valor, and Gideon does not feel like a great man. In fact, he is hiding because he doesn't know what else to do. And God tells him to come on, I want you to use you to lead the people out of their oppression. And Gideon is scared and he does this fleece thing. And for those of you who don't know what a fleece is, it's when you, you, you ask God, if I do so and so, you do so and so, then I'll know that you're speaking to me. And Gideon does the fleece thing, and finally he's convinced that God has called him, and he's ready to respond. And it's in verses 2 and 3 that you begin to see what I would call Gideon's defining moments. The scripture says, the Lord said to Gideon, you, you, you have too many warriors, because Gideon has sent the word out that they're going to fight the, the Midianites and the men respond in great numbers. Thousands of them respond. But in verse 2, it says, The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many warriors with you. If I, if I let all of you fight the Midianites, the Israelites will boast to me that they saved themselves by their own strength. Therefore, tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid may leave and go home. Twenty-two thousand went home. The Midianites are 135,000. Gideon is told to send home those who are timid and afraid, and 22,000 went home, leaving him with 10 thousand, ten thousand, a hundred and thirty-five thousand of the enemy. I call this a defining moment. You know, we, we are facing a, a defining moment right now, what I would call externally or nationally. I believe our country right now is in a defining moment. In the book, The Fourth Turning, published 30 years ago, the authors build a strong case for what, what we are going through right now as a nation. They said we are on the verge of a national crisis. Let me quote to you what they said. They said, with this time of trouble will come seeds of social rebirth. America will share a regret about recent mistakes and resolve to do something about it. America will pass a great gate in history, commensurate with the American Revolution, the Civil War, the twin emergence of the Great Depression and World War II. And whether we acknowledge it or not, we are in a defining moment right. nationally. We're also at a defining moment, what I call internally, or as a church. 
I believe that as a church, we are facing yet another defining moment. Over the past several years, we have lost hundreds of members. Some have retired. Some have relocated to less expensive housing. Many of them who have left were our Sunday school teachers. They were our servant leaders. They were our tithers. They were the ones who carried this church year after year. We have experienced significant staff changes, and replacing staff always takes time and disrupts because there's learning curves that's got to occur. People have got to get adjusted to new personalities and change. And whether we like it or not, this, this is a defining moment for every member of this church. You know, defining moments surface the, the potential inside us. It's like, a, it's like tea and hot water. Defining moments bring out our true colors. It isn't the defining moment that makes us. It's the defining mo moment that simply reveals what is already inside of us. And we come through a pandemic. And the question is, what is that going to reveal about us? What does our response to this which we have been experiencing going to surface for us to see about ourselves? Oh, yes, this is a defining moment. It's a defining moment not only internally but also individually. Some of us are at defining moment in our lives right now. We are at a testing and proving moments. Often a defining moment will come with some pain. For some of us, it is in sickness that it comes. For another, it may be in conflict. For some, it's being rejected by someone. For another, it's wrenching disappointment. Defining moments come to us ready or not. The question I would raise for us today is, is, if we are in fact at a defining moment, what are we going to do about that? How are we going to respond to that? What did Gideon do in his defining moment? His numbers had gone down from 22,000 to 10,000. And then you read in verses 4 through 7, God increases the heat. It says, but the Lord told Gideon, there are still too many. He's gone from 22,000 to 10,000, and God says, that's still too many. Keep in mind, the Midianites have 135,000. The scripture says, bring them down to the spring and I will sort out who will go with you and who will not. When Gideon took his warriors down to the water, the Lord told him, divide the men into two groups. In one group, put all those who cup water in their hands and lap it like tongues like dogs. In another group, put all those who kneel down and drink with their mouths in the stream. Get this. This is what's crucial. God says, separate those who get down and dip the water out, and they use their hands. What's important there? They're keeping their weapon in their hands. The others, he said, they lay down and they lick from the water. If you lay down like this to lick from the water, where's your weapon? God says, send those home. Only 300 of the men drank from their hands. All the others got down on their knees and drank with their mouths in the stream. The Lord told Gideon, with these 300 men, I will rescue you and give you the victory over the Midianites. Send all the others home. We talk about a defining moment. What do you think those 300 men were doing while they waited for Gideon to tell them the plan? 
I'll tell you what they were doing. They were deepening the relationship that they had with each other. They were saying to each other, will you watch my back? Will you cover me? If I don't make it, will you go home and tell my spouse that I did my best? They were deepening the relationship, sharing their concerns, making promises to one another, deepening the relationship so that as they went into battle, they went into battle with relationships knitted one to another. Pastor Tammy tells us that at this our defining moment, we need to take a fresh look at what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. She said we should discover God. In our defining moment, she said, discover God. Then she said, we should discover ourselves and deepen our relationship with God. She left the last part for me and with one another. Deepen our relationship with God and with one another. The truth is, like it or not, to be a disciple of Christ requires to enter into a relationship with other followers of Christ. There are two things you cannot do by yourself. You cannot marry. And you cannot be a Christian. A lot of people want to avoid this part of the Christian life, and I, and I do understand why. Some people have had bad experiences with church people. Some have been deeply hurt by church people. Some have received bad counsel that messed up their lives. Some have been abused by people in leadership who misuse their authority to satisfy their own greeds and lust for power. And as valid and in as unfortunate as those criticisms may be, they do not negate the clear teachings of the scriptures nor the need we all have to be in relationship with others in the community of believers. I can say people mix me up, but that does not allow me to walk away from being in a relationship with the people of God. Some people think that they have fulfilled this obligation by becoming members of a church. And I want to say, but membership in a church and relationship with the members of that church are not the same thing. Many people join a church, but they do not enter into relationships with other people in that church. The Bible says this in Romans chapter 12 and verse 5, we belong to one another. Which begs the question, why is that so important? Why does over and over and over again, God keeps talking about this one another stuff? Why is it so critical at defining moments to be in relationship with other people? Now, I will acknowledge that there are some of us prefer to face defining moments alone. And there are some advantages to dealing with it with life alone. When you go it alone, other people don't get in your way. When you go it alone, you don't have to worry about what other people think. And you don't have to care how your choices impact other people's lives. When you go it alone, you don't have to compare yourself to other people. You don't have to compare yourself to how successful they are, how smooth their bark is. In fact, alone, you can recognize yourself as superior to everybody else there is around you. When you go it alone and something good happens, you don't have to share that with anyone. You give all the credit and glory and all the reward to yourself. 
When you go out alone, you can distance yourself from all the other people so they can't hurt you or complicate your life with their problems. And of course, when you go out alone, you can skip church and no one will notice. You can go in the hospital, no one will visit. You can have problems with your spouse or kids and no one will interfere. And you can lose your job and struggle to survive and no one will care. There are some advantages to going it alone. One of the significant dangers, though, in going it alone is that it's easier to get broken and snapped when two in two when there is nobody there but you. But there are dozens of real advantages to facing defining moments God's way. And let me suggest just three reasons why deepening your relationships with others can make a difference. The first is that when you fall, someone is there to pick you up. When you fall, someone is there to pick you up. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 10 says, If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But people who are alone when they fall are in real trouble. No matter how self-reliant, no matter how competent, no matter how capable we may be, sooner or later, something is going to knock us down. At some point, every one of us is going to fall somewhere. And it may be a decision we make because of events which are out of our control. It may be an unexpected career or business setback. It may be a loss of your job, the loss of your health, the victim of a crime. You may get sued or maybe a marital or family problem. But someday, somewhere, something is going to go wrong for every one of us. And the question is, when you have relationships and when you go through that something, whatever it is, there'll be somebody there to help you get through that. At some point when you reach that bottom and the core falls apart and that day comes, you're going to need somebody to lean on. You're going to need somebody when the bottom falls out to encourage you not to give up when you're drowning. You're going to need somebody to pray for you and remind you that God is still good and his faithfulness will endure forever. You're going to need somebody to help us slowly get back on our feet and put our lives back together again. You see, when you deepen your relationship with others in the faith community, somebody will be there for you. And you will be there for somebody as well. You don't want to get to that spot alone. I remember we had a sister in this church who uh, she was kind of new to us. And uh, her husband got sick and uh, was dying. And I went to the hospital to see him when I got the word. And there she was sitting out in the aisles, by herself, alone. Now, get this. Her husband was dying, and she was there alone. I quickly called back to the church office, and I said to our administrator, get some people down here. Nobody should be going through anything like this by themselves. And the folks turned out in droves to make sure that she never went through that problem by herself. Amen. Amen. When you have relationships with others, you will not have to go through difficulties alone. There will be somebody there to pick you up. Amen. Amen. The second is that when you're fearful, somebody is there to protect you. Ephesians chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 12 says, A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. When these words were written, the way in which wars were fit, were fit was by soldiers standing back to back 
They would stand back to back so that someone behind them was protecting them from the enemy who came from this direction. We have the opportunity when we are in the family of God to have somebody to cover our back and protect us when we are in experiences that will hurt us. I remember a young man in our church, young fella. In fact, he was just a teenage kid. He was being accused of hurting somebody up in Northern California. The word was that he had thrown a stone into an open door and hit a kid. And they wanted to put that young boy in jail. And when we got the word here in this church, we loaded up our bus. We drove 50 plus people up to Yuba, California. They hadn't seen that many black people in years, if ever. We stood on the courtroom steps. We stood everywhere. We marched up and down the sidewalk. We said that this young man is not going to become a statistic, another statistic in this country. And we were there to protect him. And I have to believe that the reason that thing got thrown out of court was because there were people there who cared and who was there to protect him from receiving judgment that he should not receive. Amen. Amen. Sometimes our greatest need for protection is from ourselves. Sometimes we wrestle with temptations and bad habits that for us are difficult to resist. And we need someone there who can protect us even from ourselves. Blessed is the man or woman who has someone who can walk with them and keep them from stumbling and falling into that world which would hurt them and sometimes destroy them. This is protection that comes from the family of faith. If you don't have relationships, when things are happening to you, you don't have people there to protect you. Now, I'm going to tell you something that you may think this is awful coming from a pastor. But it's the truth. One of our young adults had gotten threatened. And he was told that after church, there was somebody going to come here and they were going to beat him up. So I sat in the front of the church in the old building. I got two of the biggest men we had in this church. (laughs) And I said, I want you guys to go out there and stand by that brother. Don't do nothing, just stand by that brother. And if that fellow shows up, well, (laughs) protection. When we have relationships, we have protection. Amen? Amen? The third and final thing is that when you are stagnant, someone is there to help you grow. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, a friend sharpens a friend. We are designed for relationship, and God uses those relationships to help us to grow. We cannot be what God wants us to be without other people. In 2003, there was a very heartwarming movie called Seabiscuit that hit the big screen. It was a movie about a racehorse and three people who together began to grow because of that relationship. I want you to watch this video for a little bit to help you to see that. And don't miss the words that are printed on the screen when it begins. It's very important to know what's going on. To the future! I'll take him. He's got a fractured foot. If you're gonna shoot him anyway, I'll save you the bullet. Red Pollard, Mr. and Mrs. Howard. Yeah, hi. Hello. Nuts. Well, at least he wasn't expensive. 
Every horse is good for something. You don't throw a whole life away just cause it's banged up a little. He just needs to learn how to be a horse again. How far do you want me to take him? Charlie stops. Let's see what you got, boy. Your horse just broke the track record of Tamfran. Well, I just think this horse has a lot of heart. I'll lay even money that this nag seed biscuit couldn't even finish six furlongs. I told you, look out for Rosemont. It's not my fault. Stop, he was flying up your day. No, I can't! What? See out there! He lied to us. What do you mean? He's blind in one eye. You yeah, don't throw a whole life away just because it's banged up a little bit. Look at us! Our horse is too small, our jockey is too big. <laughs> Everybody loses a couple, and you either pack up and you go home or you keep fighting. He's kind of small, isn't he? Gonna look a lot smaller in a second, Georgie. that because that was very quick but that was the best I could find to show the story. You've got three people, a millionaire whose son just died, a cowboy who's washed up and a jockey who can't see out of it one eye. Yeah. And you got a horse that's too small to really be a racehorse. But the three of them together found a way to help each of them grow and they were able to win a race that they shouldn't have won. Just because you're flawed don't mean you ought to be thrown away. No, I want you to get that. Every single one of us in here are flawed. From the pulpit to the back door, every single one of us are flawed. But just because we're flawed doesn't mean we ought to be discarded and thrown away. Deepening our relationships with others means I accept you with your flaws. I've got my own flaws. You've got your flaws. But we don't throw each other away because we have flaws. We rally around each other and help us to become the best version of ourselves that we can be. Amen. 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 And we help each other. I went to the house of a young, well, he wasn't a young, one of the members of our church, and I was talking to him about something, and he said, you know, Pastor, patience is not your strong suit. <laughs> he was trying to help me to grow. And sometimes people will say things to us that at first may shake us a little, but we're here to help each other grow. And we rally around each other so that we can help each other grow into what it is that God wants us to be. Hear what Romans 12 says. Romans 1, I want us to help each other with the faith we have. Your faith will help me and my faith will help you. That's why Bill Withers said we need somebody to lean on. All of us need somebody to lean on. And we learn to say the right things to one another because of the relationships that we have with one another. One more. One more video. I want you to watch this. I'm getting there. I'll be done soon. You're not a quitter. Winners don't do what they're supposed to. Champions do. And you're a star. 
and you shine. That's what you do. That's what you do every day. He says to one another, you're a star. Just because you have flaws don't mean that you can't be what God wants you to be. And we encourage one another with the words that lift us up. And we deepen those relationships with those words. Listen, people don't love you because you look good. People love you because you make them feel good. The more we are kinder to other people, the more they will love us as we invest in them and help them to become all that God desires them to be. Somewhere in this church, God has placed a person that is here to help you grow. And you need to recognize that in opening myself up to that relationship, I can experience what it is that God has for me. Now, I will admit that there are some times you have to hold somebody off. I like I had a sister in this church who came to me one Sunday and she said, you know what's wrong with you, Pastor? You don't preach about sin enough. And I said, well, it's probably because I think people already know they're sinners. And they come to church to find out, is there a God that can help me? They don't need me to remind them of their sin. They need to know, is there somebody that can help me to stop sinning? that can make me a better version of myself. So there are times when you will have to ask, put your hand up to them and just say no, but those will be rare. That will be rare. Most of the time, God's going to send people into your life that's there designed to help you to grow. So this is your defining moment. This is our defining moment. And the question is, are we going to make it work for us? Are we going to learn like, like Gideon did and allow God to take this moment and deepen our relationships enough to us, for us to finish what he has started in us? My daughter, my other daughter, is a fitness person, and she's been working out with Ruby and I every week. And she was telling us about one of the people who was a trainer for her, who would say to her, when you got to a certain place, can you finish? Can you finish? Now, let me help you quickly understand what that means. That means that after I've done 12 reps, and I'm supposed to do 15, and at 12, I want to quit. And the coach is saying, can you finish? And I want to say that to you, South Bay. We started 36 years ago. Can you finish? Can you finish what it is that God's called us to do? I pray that we can. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take our time with this one. church say amen let the church say amen God has spoken let the church say amen one more time we'll say that again let the church say amen let the church say amen. God has spoken. 
let the church say amen. All you got to do is make this your response to whatever he says for the healing of your body, to the raising of the dead. No matter how you're feeling or how your world is reeling or how your world is reeling, battle on through the night because you're going to win that fight even in the valley or standing in your Red Sea or continue to say, God has spoken. Yes, he has. Let the church say yay. Let's say that one more time. We're going to make this our response. Well, make this your response. Amen. To whatever he says. Amen. From the healing of your body. Amen. No matter how you're feeling. Amen. Or what your world is really. Battle on through the night. Because you're going to win this fight. Amen. Even in the valley. Amen. Or standing on the Red Sea. Continue to say, because your help is on the way. God has spoken. Yes, he has. Let the church say amen. God has spoken. God has spoken. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Even when you're lonely. Even when you're lonely, no one to call. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. When you're lonely at night and nowhere to turn to, God has spoken. Yes, yes. Let the church say amen. Amen, amen, amen. God has spoken. Let the church say amen. Choir musicians, and I just am so grateful for. And my mother, their health is so wonderful that we still get the benefit of him as our shepherd. Amen. 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 Family, as we prepare to close today, I do just want you to go with that question in your heart. Can we finish? Can we finish? And I do believe that God is doing a move in this church we may be smaller than we used to be, but I believe we're just as mighty with the Holy Spirit. Amen? And I also believe that God is not through with us yet, so the question does hold for each of us. Can we and will we finish? Amen? As we prepare to close, we want to celebrate, continue our celebration. And so our sister Elaine, if you know, is a wonderful baker. And so we have anniversary cupcakes for you to pick up and go. We want to keep you safe, so we're not asking you to linger. But we do have cupcakes in the multi-purpose room. The air is flowing in there. And so uh, we want you just to enjoy that special treat. Also want to just let you know that we are right at our harvest season. We're getting started. And as you know, it has been our custom to, to bless this community through our hearty harvest, to let them know that they are not alone, that people are loving and thinking about them. And so we are about to kick off today our donations. And you can uh, pick up a bag like this in the multipurpose room. Sister Nita is headed over there right now. She'll make it available to you. And it tells you exactly what to bring. 
uh, and you can return these in, within the next two weeks. We would like to get these ready to give for Thanksgiving. Just one note, um, you'll notice that the, this, this year, the Compassion Network, our community partner, is asking for a little bit more than they normally do for the gift cards. They ask for a $50 gift card. And so I wanna say, if that feels prohibitive for you, give what you can. And if, you, if we run out of bags, then we will accept gift cards and we will supplement whatever gift cards we need. So if you wanna get a gift card or pick up a bag, we want to let those in need in our immediate community know that they are loved and not alone. Amen. And also, if you know of anyone that is in need of a bag, we would like to prepare some extra bags. And so please let the office know, and we want to spread God's love every way we can. Well, please join me as we close in our benediction. And actually, Brother Graylin, you gave us a wonderful benediction already. And so let us just let that resonate in our hearts. God, as we leave today, Lord, may we continue to discover wonderful new things about you every day. May we deepen in our intimacy and in our relationship with you. And Lord, may we deepen with one another in such a way that this world will say, we want that love that we see at South Bay. And may we take it everywhere we go. And as we have heard, let the church say, let the church say, let the church say, amen. God bless you, family.